Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. When we are talking here in Riga with you, uh, this is a very challenging time in Ukraine regarding also grain deal. This is harvest time for Ukrainian farmers and we know that your ports are blocked and the only way out is uh, for the land roads through Europe. Yesterday there was a meeting in Brussels, uh, there is the idea of uh, opening uh, solidarity corridors via Europe, but there is no like uh, real decision yet. How do you see this situation in Ukraine deal? Well, first of all, I would say that um, since last year when the war started, uh, we've been uh, in the situation when the wall, uh, world has been uh, blackmailed by the situation of Russians not only thinking of military um, aims but also thinking how to to block Ukraine from from uh, from supporting the general world and uh, the idea is uh, clearly linked to, to Soviet Union practices to create a famine I around the world and also to by blocking uh, actually the exports of uh, of grains and um, the following is uh, also linked to, to their idea to, to have more revenues. Because when they block Ukraine, they start to, to actually to sell their grain and uh, the price is higher than expected. So last year, first, uh, what we, we actually seen was that markets showed us that the price was too high for everyone even to, to, to finance it. Because of that, I guess the general uh, solution which came from um, global level and the UN mainly and uh, with the participation of Turkey was to have a, a, a grain deal uh, which is an initiative to, to actually to allow exports of grains which is destined to, to African mainly countries, Asian countries and, this, and Latin America as well. So that was a focus to help those who are in need and who cannot pay the highest price. It wasn't about generally other countries. And what we see uh, in one year perspective that uh, uh, since that time we, from our side, we implemented our uh, obligations. We, we managed to export 33 million uh, tons of uh, grain. But uh, through this uh, period of time, we, we saw that Russians were blackmailing uh, on a daily basis us and also putting several obstacles to, to, to actually implement the initiative. For those who do not know, the initiative was two agreements. One agreement between uh, Ukraine, uh, UN and Turkey. Another agreement was between Russia, uh, UN and Turkey. And our part of the deal is fully implemented. So we do what, what we are asked to do, but uh, Russians do not implement the deal between UN and Turkey. So, and that's what we see. After that uh, one year, they understood that they cannot block at all uh, by, I would say, soft me uh, means. And then they decided just to block, uh, in general, uh, the, the trade and all exports which, uh, which uh, we, we did and also put some propaganda on it. Two points here. First of all, uh, since the beginning of last agreement, uh, they did checks for one, two cargoes per day. It's not possible to, to do any exports of such million tonnage uh, exports uh, in, uh, with uh, checks of one, two cargoes per day in, in general. And it's possible that everyone can check it by themselves. Turkey side can, can do it easily. Second one, they, they put this propaganda and put it said it that uh, two sorts of all exports went uh, to Western countries instead of uh, Africa, Asia, uh, etc. Uh, I do have uh, another data. So 62% of overall exports uh, actually went to, to Africa, Asian countries. And that's what, what has happened. Another point what they did is they not only blocked the export, but they started to hit our infrastructure, which has nothing to do with the military targets. So you block exports, and then they started to attack Odessa, and they also started to, to attack the nuke. So what we have by the end is that the uh, system also attacked, how it could affect actually if the export is blocked, how it could help uh, to, to do military actions, Nothing can be done in that way. So they, they, their clear idea is to create this 
attention at global level and also to use it for, for, for their own reason. But how do you see how the global world should uh, act in this situation? Of course, one thing is, the main thing is to finish the war, uh, which is, as we understand, Russia is not listening at all, but in this uh, particular, maybe short term, term uh, solution, how do you see? I will rely to, to, to that decision that uh, has been discussed yesterday in Brussels, as well as uh, generally to UN. So we have to continue pushing Russia with all diplomatic efforts and other uh, instruments which uh, generally the ZMOB has uh, to continue having the um, uh, maritime exports because uh, you cannot assure by a land export the, the volume. Uh, so we have to continue that and we have to restore the peace and all we're taking over control on, on the Black Sea. Black Sea does not belong to, to Russia, so we need to, to invest time on that. Secondly is uh, what we started even from the last year, a discussion that uh, Europe generally, including Ukraine, have to reassess the situation and all these uh, obstacles which we have currently with exports and with all uh, railway system. So we need to, to foster Rail Baltic implementation. We need to think about tariffs of, for uh, generally for uh, rail transportation. Uh, both Ukraine, Poland, all Baltic states in, in common and the European Commission should be in the lead as we are going, you are part of European Union and we are going to be part of the European Union. And I'm happy and that uh, discussions went well yesterday and the EU Commissioner for Agriculture already announced that the European Union should pay um, some, uh, some resources to, to companies to cover tariff. Because if not, then the price of uh, Ukrainian grain uh, comparing to Russian grain would be too high. And for generally, uh, Russia will uh, succeed with what they wanted to, to show to globally to other countries. That they have more grain, they can easily uh, trade it, in no matter that they even steal uh, grain from Ukrainian territories and try to sell it. And as well as uh, they try to restore negotiations, they are trustful and they, that they could use still uh, their logistics tra transportation system, including Belarus and Russia, Belarus which is under control of Russians, to, to restore this trade. No, it, it, we should not uh, be blind in, in this situation. It's uh, uh, only linked to one thing. They want to abolish sanctions. They want to restore the economic activity and win this war. So if we have to find solutions uh, to that as well. And we have to, to show that there is a solidarity. Why those lanes are called lanes of solidarity? Because it's solidarity. It has nothing to do with business of one co uh, country or another one, like a block of Ukrainian experts. We would be happy to, to create the necessary, uh, I would say, green corridors from Ukraine to Baltic states through Polish territory using only one road, both uh, for trucks and both for trains. And that will be helpful for everyone. But along that, we need also to, to, to think about tariffs and also to think about mid-term and long-term perspective. What kind of system of, uh, of logistics should be between uh, Ukraine and Baltic states? That what what we discussed for quite a long time and we probably it's high time we took decision. What's going on in the Ukrainian front? This is a question which people ask now because there are a lot of ex expectations regarding counter-attack. It seems to us at the moment that the uh, situation is rather standstill. What can you tell us? Well, it's, uh, I would say my president uh, has been uh, presenting this case several times in different media and uh, he waged uh, the life of citizens and the time. So if more time is needed to, to save more lives, then we will be doing it uh, in a longer perspective. So I, I fully understand that there is uh, quite uh, uh, fatigue uh, in minds of different people around the world that are uh, being depressed by, by the war. But uh, in general, Ukrainians are paying this uh, check and giving their lives to, to protect not only Ukrainian territory and have it back, but also protect global security uh, of the situation. You cannot allow, allow an aggressor to take uh, one country because you would like to live uh, um, uh, your life uh, uh, peacefully. 
you, you have to understand that uh, Ukrainian people uh, see how many uh, tragedy this, this war uh, brought us and how, how much we need to, to spend on, uh, on getting back territories. And that is why counteroffensive is not that fast as we could imagine in a movie or I don't know in a, in a story or in a video game. It has nothing to do with that. It's a real life. We are talking about thousands of people dead. And we are talking not about military, but also civilians, by kids. So if you are inside the war, you think twice, even seven times uh, before uh, cutting actually uh, the age of, of this decision. And uh, what also your people say uh, is, uh, you can give us uh, weapons, but uh, we are as many as we are. Uh, what can you tell about? Uh, 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 what can you tell, please, about uh, the uh, support uh, for Ukraine at the moment with military uh, equipment? Uh, do you see that it is uh, sufficient? Uh, do does it come slow? Uh, what kind of needs Ukraine has at the moment? Well, um, first of all, I would say that uh, Ukrainians is a nation which uh, is really grateful to all those who, who come along with us in a time of need. And uh, we are really grateful to, to ordinary people from different countries, including Latvia. And we do it on a daily basis when we, when we see this support. Um, I fully rely on our uh, military people when they, say, when they are in contact with uh, other military people around the world. And they have this fantastic Rammstein uh, format, which is uh, gathering of ministers and also other mi uh, military people, um, and they see how much time is needed to to, to transfer some ty some type of uh, equipment, and how much time is needed to to train people and train uh, servicemen to use it. So everything has, um, I would say, Russia uh, rationale for. Um, for actually for time, when, how much we need to, to get these weapons. Probably sometimes we as observers, we see that uh, it takes too long like for F-16 to, to get F-16 or sometimes we say that uh, it would have been better if uh, somebody decided to, to allocate weapons earlier or to send them. But we did it. We received first fingers before the war, before this actually uh, huge uh, aggression started. And uh, with uh, these small weapons, but enough weapons, we also protected Kyiv city. So it means a, a huge uh, for us. Sometimes a quick action is a better than a uh, longer decision. But generally, we, all of us, we have to find a response to that. Are we ready to, to actually to end this war? or we still believe that there will be peace talks and somebody has to forget about thousands of lives and losing territory or actually mined territory. So Ukraine became a territory the most mined around the world. And the, the mining will take uh, dozens of years and uh, billions of, of, of resources to get the territory demining. And it has nothing to do to compare with generally with the uh, uh, cost of uh, weapons which could be used to, to, uh, to get territories faster back. So for example, why counteroffensive is not that fast? Because territories were mined. So we, we lost plenty of time because Russians started to mine territory. And when our troops start to actually to, to start uh, an offensive, uh, they, first of all, they think about people's life. And they cannot just go through a mine hole and uh, saying that nothing has happened. We do not possess uh, F-16 or other types of uh, aircraft which would be uh, necessary to, to be in fast as this war. Or Atacams, for example, so you wide-range uh, weapons. That means that uh, if, think, if you think twice, something could be done faster. But there is a clear uh, um, perspective of a victory. And I do believe that recent summit in Vilnius at least shows that at the level of G7 and those countries which are willing to join the joint declaration of G7 is also a, a, a clear message that despite no status in NATO right now, 
there is a clear will to win this war and uh, all uh, Western partners are on the side of Ukraine. Uh, when we were last time in, in Ukraine, it was uh, this June, people said uh, sometimes, please don't forget us. We, are, we would not want you to get uh, tired, fatigued. This is what we feel in Ukraine. Um, being here in uh, Riga, how do you as ambassador feel? Are we in Latvia? Uh, already a little bit settled down that way that we don't uh, care so much about Ukraine or contrary, we are very active. How do you see that? Well, once again, um, I, on daily basis, I, uh, I spend quite a uh, big time to, uh, to sign letters uh, to, to, to pass for humanitarian convoys to Ukraine and all different types of goods. This means that uh, there is no big fatigue, I would say. We also have to, uh, to understand that fatigue could be of different levels. So what does it mean? So do you have a fatigue? You should probably say yes, because everyone who is a normal person would not like to, be, to live in a world when there is a war. And to be under pressure that you have a border with Russia and they might decide to, to come to your country and uh, you fully understand that it's somewhere else, not in your country, but you have this in mind. You see it from media, you see it from uh, social networks, you also have friends or families living on different parts. So it's not a fatigue, it's, I would say, uh, a life pressure on you. So we are not used uh, to, to such a situation. Probably uh, we, as, we as this generation, which is compared to a generation 100 years ago, when there was the First World War and people lived through this time. So we are trying to get used how we how we behave in this situation. The most important is not to actually turn around and uh, say, no matter what happens, we are generally live in our country and uh, it's your problems. So I do not say this. I don't see people turning around. I see that people uh, actually fed up with the situation. This is a, a correct actually word uh, for, for this. And they would like to end it as, as soon as possible. Latvians do what, what is possible to their end. Uh, politicians do what is possible to their end. But there are limits. And always, uh, actually, there are some countries which can do it uh, in a faster way. And we still have to continue uh, pushing on others to, to, to win this. That's actually what happens. And I think there are some very nice initiatives as Twitter convoy and also people uh, try to help uh, very privately uh, to Ukraine. Uh, uh, when you meet with these people, how do you feel as Ukrainian, as ambassador? <coughs> Well, I'm, I would say every time when I see them, I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised uh, on their motivation, uh, what they do, and uh, they, they still uh, live a distant life uh, and they continue working, they continue uh, thinking about uh, Latvia and, and uh, what is uh, around here to develop it. At the same time, they think uh, how to help Ukrainians at this moment, and respectively, not only military, but all, also civilians. And um, I, I, I actually really grateful to them, especially to Twitter Convoy, to to which, uh, to the dot all those who uh, who donate, but uh, plenty of others like uh, singer or sucking artists, uh, and uh, those people are fantastic. I would say they do it on a daily basis, and they even do not ask anything in return, because uh, I feel that it's about values. And uh, I'm proud that I can gently with them do something. But also, not only those who are coming, like uh, politicians. Recently, we, we had a meeting with the Minister of Defense. She, together with her colleagues, decided to, to, to send us uh, also another type of convoy of cars. It's the biggest contribution ever. So I'm also waiting for Minister of Health to, to say something about ambulances. Also, a lot of expectations. So what is important is that everyone here is thinking what to do, but not under pressure, but because of their will. And that's what I see from different levels, from civil society up to politicians, from different political parties. And I'm admiring uh, their support at all. 
And finally, uh, Mr. Ambassador, how do you see your years here in Latvia? What uh, are your um, most challenging tasks? Are you preparing? F uh, you are preparing for, and uh, maybe the ideas you would like to fulfill as ambassador in Latvia. Well, I'm uh, I'm here since May, and uh, so far it's uh, it's an ex ex actually intensive work. But uh, I expected this because we are in the situation when we need to find uh, solutions. Um, what is important is that uh, during the war time we need to focus on different areas. One of my focuses here is not only military and support to, to armed forces, but also civilians. We need to, to develop these uh, people to people relationships. We need to, to develop uh, necessary skills. It's a, there is a high uh, a number of Ukrainians which are coming to, to Latvia. Uh, more or less in one year and a half time, we are creating a community. So it has been here before, but still since the beginning of war, there is a new community here. And uh, my task here is also to, to, to create necessary uh, circumstances for culture development also being uh, fully in line with general um, ideas of uh, politicians and society of Latvia. We fully respect that and I do believe that in upcoming years we, we need just to strengthen this and need to show what, what kind of practices we have already in Ukraine, what good we can bring to, to your society as well and what we can take back once the war will be ended and once Ukrainians will come back, believe me, a lot of Ukrainians will be happy to come back. Because only when the war starts, you start to understand how precious this is your country and your home which you lived in and your people who are around there. So only, only after that you can, you can understand that. Thank you. Thank you.